Hi there, my name is Jillian Ehrlich. I'm a family nurse practitioner at the Center for Healing Neurology in Seattle, Washington. My practice is rooted in functional medicine, neurology, and Ayurveda, which is the traditional medical system of India. And today we're gonna to be talking about neurology, stress, the mind, and tools that we can use for containing our emotions. Neurology and Ayurveda make an easy and natural partnership as they both focus on how our perceptions drive our experience. This means that what we think about and what we feel can actually change our physiology. This doesn't mean that our anxiety is here to ruin us. It really means that we need to take charge and be intentional about how we use our mind and faculties to meet the challenges that we face, be these a global viral pandemic or just getting through the day. Having the consciousness that we do as humans is, like everything, a two-sided coin. The benefit and beauty is that our minds can range so far. We alone as the animals on the planet can understand rocket science. Well, some of us can understand rocket science. I don't actually, but that's my example. Um, city planning, the internet, and the flip side is that we can also experience fear and anxiety through anticipation or memory, even, then when, even when in this moment we are actually safe and secure. Our mental state can lift us or sink us. What's most important to remember is that as humans, we are built for resilience and recovery. Over the millennia that we've been around, we've encountered some stressors here and there, and we've developed built-in systems for restoration, for managing these stressors and for restoration. We can do this. You can do this. This stressor will go away. Another will come. This is the nature of life. As Joe Dispenza says, the best way to predict the future is actually to create the future. It's important to note that we never return to who we were before a big stressor. A healthy trajectory brings us to a new normal in which we're able to function even better having lived through the stressor and come through intact. Who we will be individually and collectively after COVID-19 goes away remains to be seen. Our best shot at a healthy recovery is to pay attention now and to move through this with our eyes open and our metal intact. One foundational way to stay as awake and aware as possible through uncertainty and disorder is to continually reconnect the mind, which can, which can traverse space to the moon and time between our childhood and suppositions about our death um, and our body and connect our mind and our body, which is right here and right now, only in this one minute, in this one moment, do we actually have our body. This is actually the literal definition of yoga, which means to yoke, to unite, to connect. In any practice of yoga, we are connecting our mind and our body. We are linking the mind and the body, which allows us to listen and respond to our actual visceral experience. Linking the mind and the body gives us the broadest, most stable foundation for responding to any threat or fear. You scared? You feeling uncertain? Link your mind to your body. There are countless ways to connect the mind and body. If, while I am talking, you close your eyes and you take a deep breath and you pay attention to your body, Guess what? You're doing yoga. You're connecting the mind and body. There are as many ways to connect as there are people to do the connecting. You likely already know some activities that kind of bring you home, so to speak, that help you ground and relax. And this is different from watching TV or having a drink or eating a candy bar. Um, although it seems like those activities can relax you, this is not linking the body with the mind. You are relaxing without awareness. Going after these mindless activities to quiet the internal noise just reflects the need for more frequent and intentional mind-body linking practices. Today, we'll focus on five approaches for resiliency and recovery. I've chosen these directions because they A, represent a wide range of human emotional management. They don't require any tools besides your body and your mind, and hopefully you carry those with most, most places you go. And C, you can do them right now, you can do them again and again, and you can do them every day as you like or need for the rest of your life. They are ordered loosely as prevention to treatment, but the best intervention is always the one that's easiest to start and that you will do reliably. So pick and choose as you so like. Even though you may feel better after just a few minutes of any of these exercises, that experience will be fleeting without consistent practice. After watching this video, consider getting out a piece of paper or electronic paper, however you set things up for yourself, and writing yourself out a practice schedule. Which exercises you might do, when will you do them, for how long, and remember that it can take 40 days to ingrain a new habit, so plan for at least that long. So, these five exercises include 
quieting the mind and pulling the sen withdrawing the senses, focusing on the breath, singing, moving the body, and finding a pal, doing discharge in relationship. So number one. Number one, withdrawing the senses. So this will be a mini sample of a classic type of sitting meditation. I will guide you through, so just hang in there. You're welcome to close your eyes. The object is to remove your attention from your senses, and this can be challenging. If you think, don't see the couch, don't listen to the cars outside, don't smell the toast, then your focus is still on those things. So instead, imagine lowering the shades on your senses for just a few minutes. Bring your awareness and your attention inside the body with each breath deepen your listening on the inside. You may start listening with any part that's most active inside your body. Perhaps this is pain in a joint, a muscle, or a headache. Perhaps this is a place you feel an emotion in your body. Some feel fear in their belly, anticipation in their belly. Some feel grief or sadness in their heart or their chest. If a particular part of your body is talking to you, just stay there and listen. Invite this part. Tell me more, say to it. Tell me more and continue taking long deep breaths as you keep your attention in that part that's calling for you. If there's no outstanding noise, then consider starting with your feet. With this next breath, we'll just practice this. So with this next breath, put your mind into listening to your feet. Oh dear feet, what do you need to tell me? These feet that carry us from place to pa place, these feet that carry us from place to place, that we stuff into shoes and stinky socks, or that if we go barefoot, actually connect us to the earth. Breathe for your feet. And then with this next breath, move up into your lower legs and your knees, how they support us, how they get us to the places we need to go, how they've worked or how they've been pained or how they've struggled for us. Listen there. Continue moving up with each successive breath, to taking stock of what it is telling you, taking stock of what your body is telling you. Lovingly respond with compassion for any distress that you find and stay in each place as long as you like or need. Feel free to pause this video to complete this process. In the interest of time, we'll move on to other approaches, but be sure to close this exercise gently with a mental release of attention from your own cells and a gradual lifting of the shades of your senses to return to the outside world. Following the breath. Sometimes there's just too much happening to openly listen. More of an anchor is needed. If this is the case, or if it's easier to start with this, develop a practice of following the breath. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of types of breath practices. From ancient India, this is called pranayam. In neurology, we know the brainstem triggers us to breathe, so by watching our innate breathing patterns, we get a reflection of the autonomic nervous system. And by changing the cadence of our breath, we can conversely impact the, the nervous system pathways. Consider starting with yogic breathing. Put your mind along the ride of your breath as it enters your nose, preferably, or your mouth if your nose is congested. Don't think too much about that. Follow your breath into your lungs and visualize that oxygen-carbon dioxide exchange and then follow the breath as it leaves. Think about the temperature of the air in your nostrils as you inhale and exhale. Is it the same? Is it different? Is it cold outside and cold in your nostrils as it comes in, warmer as it leaves, or is the reverse true? Is it hot outside so that that air comes in heated and leaves feeling more comfortable? Another practice besides riding the breath is called four, seven, eight, four breathing or square breathing. So this is where you're gonna inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight, and hold for four. And you're, and you're going to continue going along this square breathing to regulate your breath as a way to regulate your nervous system. You can repeat this for anywhere from three to 20 breaths. You may also use a biofeedback tool like Inner Balance from heartmath.com or use another app like Breathe or Calm or Headspace as a meditation. So if the mind is too squirrely and can't stay focused on the breath, take measures to actively calm the vagus nerve, which governs our parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest, or also known as the feed and breed system, feed and breed system of the body. And it exists in contrast to the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight, flight, or freeze system. When the parasympathetic nervous system is in action, we do our best digestion, cellular repair, regeneration, restoration, 
and our body can really work on balancing out healthy immunity. So not too much inflammation, but also not too little. There's no point in digesting that grasshopper you ate two hours ago if you're running from a lion on the savanna. So that's why we want our that's why we want our parasympathetic nervous system to be activated when we're not acutely threatened. We can target the vagus nerve in a few ways, and some of these are fairly fun. So one is gargling. Uh, that may or may not be fun, but the other is singing loudly. <laughs> so you can really belt it out. This is rock country, opera, blues, sea shanties, 80s pop. Um, in my world, I really like True Colors by Cyndi Lauper or We Belong by Pat Benatar, but really it's whatever you like. By singing loudly, there's actually data that shows that you activate that vagus nerve and you trigger a parasympathetic response. So you're going to help your body move into that rest and digest uh, nervous type activity. From a traditional perspective, singing is also known as mantra. Uh, mantra, a mantra is a string of words or sounds in any language that is meaningful to you that you can repeat as a way to give your mind something to attach to besides its own uncontrollable emotions. This can be a string of words like, I am strong, I am healthy, I am here, something you made up, a prayer of any religion that uplifts you and others. One traditional mantra goes like this, may all beings everywhere be happy and free, and may the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and that freedom for all. So whatever it looks like to you, a mantra is really gonna give your mind some stair step focus so that you can just walk along those stair steps and then the mind can relax. The parasympathetic nervous system can get turned on and your body can go about its business internally metabolizing and doing the regeneration and restoration that is needed. Exercise number four, movement. If the mind is still too overwhelmed to settle, consider moving the body to expel that distress. This can start with dancing, shaking, jumping, yawning, stretching, anything that changes your experience and pulls your mind out of its distress and into the feedback from the body that's moving around you. Even a primal scream or two can be cathartic. Find some onion headlines or some funny cat videos, whatever makes you laugh. Personally, I love Michelle Wolf. I think she's a hilarious comedian but start with trying to shake, scream, cry, or laugh out tension. Once the big load of feelings has somewhat diminished, even slightly, work to wedge into that opening a connection between the mind and the body even as you continue moving. Consider making movement more rhythmic and attentive. This comes naturally with running, swimming laps, jump roping, and of course the poses that are taught in yoga. And yoga does not need to be strenuous, difficult, balancing on one leg, putting your leg over your head. There's even restorative yoga, which is one way to link the mind and body in positions that are very well supported. In fact, I have one patient who calls this nap yoga. So that is available to everybody. Anything that moves your body will move your mind. There's, an, there's also immense data about the benefit of exercise, which is different than shaking out tension, but still good. Consider a goal of three sweaty t-shirts weekly. Work at your edge, not beyond. This edge will change, as will the edges of your mind. And exercise five, relationship. If the overwhelm is still so great, and this is gonna happen for our healthcare workers, for people who are on the front lines, for people who are losing family, for people who are trying to visit their elderly parents, there is such distress in this world. Uh, for people who are losing businesses, who are losing homes, there is so much distress in this world that there is going to be there are going to be times where you cannot meditate away this grief you cannot anchor enough in your body and you're going to need to sing to yell to scream to shake to dance to move or in this fifth exercise to find a pal with which to share your burden so if there's no measure of resilience or solace that we can find in our bodies then go as able to find another living being to share that burden this can be a pet or a person, but ideally it's a being that can play, snuggle, make us laugh, just listen deeply. This can be a therapist or a friend, and hopefully you can get your, convince your friend to just hold you and say, yes, yes, tell me more, is that all? Is that all you've got? So finding a way to connect with each other, we allow each other to share the platforms of our combined minds, and that means we're not trapped by ourselves in our own anymore. Also consider in these times reaching out with intention to offer listening to others. 
Part of our worth and value in this world is anchoring our mind for others in need. We are facing some scary times on multiple fronts right now. Will we get COVID-19? Will we die? Will we lose family members? Will we infect family members? Will we be okay financially? Will we ever recover financially? Will our children flourish and regain their educational levels? What are the lasting impacts of this crisis? We know that there are gonna be incredibly devastating, lasting impacts from this crisis. That we are built for resilience and recovery. None of us may ever be the same, but for those of us still here, we have big work to do. And we will do it best with clear minds. To get that clear mind, connect and anchor into the body. Use attention, breath, singing or mantra, movement and relationship to find the rhythm of expelling distress and creating a place of inner quiet to weather the storm and any storms that will inevitably come your way. Nobody escapes unscathed. All of us will struggle and we are currently facing a particularly harrowing global struggle, but this doesn't necessitate suffering. We are built for resilience and recovery. You are built for resilience and recovery. I know that I keep saying that, but I think we forget it. We forget how strong we are. And that's the most important part of this talk is remembering that we have hope. We have ways of moving. We were built for this. We were built for trauma and recovery. And that includes you. So practice, practice, practice. Stay tuned and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos with practices from Ayurveda and neurology. Also check out our podcast for Healing Neurology wherever you get your podcast, And find out more about our clinic and this, our telemedicine services at our website, centerforhealingneurology.com. We also welcome you to email us with questions or thoughts at reception at centerforhealingneurology.com. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner, and I thank you for listening. Stay safe, my friends.